questions, Carl. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Please do. <laughs> What's excited. your favorite color? <laughs> right. Well, okay. Let's go ahead and, and get started, shall we? We'll share computer sound. All right, guys. So this is being recorded. It will be on YouTube. I don't know how long this talk is going to last. It is, uh, we got a lot to cover. So if you need to go, I totally get it. Well, um, it's going to be recorded. Um, and it will be on the Potty Nation YouTube, hopefully. So um, there is going to be a section for questions at the end. Um, so guys, thank you so much. Um, this Welcome to talk from people in European colonization. Um, ooh, let me move something around real quick. Okay, excellent. So my name is Carlton Schild, Chief Gover. I'm a PhD student in anthropology at the University of Colorado Boulder. I'm minoring in indigenous studies and museum science. I have my master's um, from Wyoming and my bachelor's from Radford. I'm Skeedy Band of Pawnee Indians, president of the Plains Anthropology Student Affairs Committee and board member of the Museum of the Pawnee Nation. I got some, let me make sure. Um, so, in the Indian way, right? Who am I? So for the Pawnees that are here that might not know who I am, this is my up at Phil Gover. Um, this is my dad with my aunt, aunt, uh, aunts and uncles here. His name is George Gover. And then there's me. And you get this form of complexion when you have three white grandparents. So um, this is my lineage here in the Pawnee Nation uh, for those who might not know where I am uh, within the nation. So I want to give a huge thank you before we start to Roger Echo Hawk, who's done a brilliant work with oral traditions with the Pawnee, Arikara, and advancing indigenous archaeology. My advisor is Dr. Doug Bamforth, Dr. Casey Carlson. Um, Dr. Bamforth really helped me with this presentation. Uh, special thanks to, you know, uh, Matt Reed, who is the Pawnee Nation Tippo, and Rob Bozell, the state archaeologist of Nebraska, who deals with me on a pretty constant basis and more than he'd probably like to. So... We got a lot to talk about, about 15,000 years into like one hour. That's what I'm going for is a one hour presentation. We're going to start in talking about archaeology in Indian country, followed by peopling of North America, Plains culture history, and why this matters. And where do the Pawnee fit in this, right? Okay. So archaeology in Indian country. There's a lot. Um, Archaeology in general, it's it's a colonial silence science, and it has a you know a, a very racist and imperial pa imperialist past. Um, a lot of you might have read Red Earth, White Lies by Vine Deloria, or if you follow Indian Country Today Media Network, you see these stories that pop up um, by Dr. Paulette Steves or Dr. Yvette Running Horse Colin uh, that are uh, have research that combats traditional archaeological information. And then also we have, you know, National Geographic promoting some of this coming from recently, there's this cave, apparently there's a 25,000 year old occupation. And so there's a lot and a lot of this has to deal with two reasons. One, higher academia is pretty, is, is there are some privilege issues, right? It predominantly caters to, to rich white kids. So there's not much access for indigenous people to get involved, but there are, and that's growing. So it's changing. And that's what I want to talk about here is um, bringing in some of these indigenous views to archaeology um, because they can inform each other. One is not greater than the other. They can inform each other. They're complementary. And you can get a better understanding of the past, a more holistic understanding of the past. Um, let me see if you use the, if you use both. Okay. And so moving from that, a huge question that I get all the time in Indian country is peopling of the Americas. Where did people come from? Or like, what do archeologists think about peopling of the Americas? So there's four big hypotheses. You know, maybe in social studies, you heard about the ice-free corridor, Beringia, of the maritime route, the Salutrian hypothesis, or oceanic colonization. And Beringia is kind of the classic one. Let me see if I can get my, oh, I don't have it. Right back during the ice age, the Pleistocene, 18,000 years ago, there was a lot of the, uh, water was locked up in ice. So there was greater land mass, which connected um, Asia with Alaska, North America. I'm going to go through these one by one and talk about them. One that I want to talk about right now is the Salutrian, and this is people coming across the Atlantic from Northern Europe. 
there's not much evidence for this. There's not really any evidence for it. It could have hunted seals. And even still, if people did do this around 17,000 years, 15,000 years ago, it would have been pre-Indo-European, so they weren't white people. And the reason why I bring this up is if you see at the bottom here, this is from a white pride worldwide website, which grabs onto this hypothesis to promote white supremacist views. There's only a select few of archeologists that really believe in this, but there's not much information behind it. And we don't have much evidence and it just doesn't stack up. And more importantly, if you look at genetic information of the earliest Americans, there are more genetically related to Siberians. Asian populations. There's no European DNA anywhere in these genomes. So no, solution hypothesis doesn't hold up. People did not come here from Europe. And there's a little bit of genetic evidence in South American populations of Polynesian or Oceanic, but it's really small and in only select few uh, populations. So this was not a primary uh, migration route, if at all. It could have been just people getting lost. We're not really sure because it just shows up in some um, DNA and, and, you know, in Southern and South America. And so we go to the ice free quarter, right? This is what everyone hears of, the Clovis first theory. And what are, what's Clovis? Well, it's a population named after these points found in Clovis, New Mexico. They all have these same points. Um, there was a huge debate in archaeology back in the day over how long have people been in America. And in Europe, they had evidence of humans, ancient humans with megafauna. And we didn't find that until... Um, George McJunkin, a former slave turned cowboy in New Mexico, was riding his ranch and saw these big bones coming out, realized they were bigger than what he's seen before and found um, this Folsom point, not Clovis, Folsom comes later, in between um, bison ribs intact. And this really settled the debate that um, people had been here in the Americas for a long time. Um, were they big game hunters? We'll get into that. And the genetics of populations of people, there's not really that many people that are found with Clovis. Um, it's once again, it's Siberian. And it, this theory is kind of holding out. There are some holdouts. I know we have archaeologists here today, and some of you might be shaking your head. I totally get it. We'll get to that towards the end. And it's also associated with the megafauna, the extinction of megafauna. So here's, you know, we had mastodon, mammoth, ground bear, cave sloths. We had all these different things. Bison antiguous, which is I think half or more than half the size of regular bison and bison latifrons, which are just terrifying. We have camels and horses and these things go extinct at towards the end of the Pleistocene. And so people have assumed because Clovis people show up when the Pleistocene go, or the, the um, megafauna go away, they must be related. So we do have evidence for this and we'll get into that, to that more, but where does it fit? Well, this is coming out within the past like 20 years. We're really starting to see that there's earlier migrations along the coast. Monte Verde, Chile, which is in the Southern end of South America has a site that's older than a lot of Clovis occupations. And it's not only older um, based on radiocarbon dating, but we have a lot of evidence for people being there. So we have these, these El Yobo projectile points. They have ma uh, massive on high and stone tools. It really looks like people were here. And then we also up in um, Washington state, we have this Manus Mastodon kill and lodged in its vertebra right back here is a bone projectile point. And it dates older than most Clovis populations. So it's really looking like the West Coast people are moving and how are they doing that by boat? And based on the radiocarbon dates that we have and the fact that we have Clovis points here, but not up here, it really looks like based on the, on the data that this maritime coastal route was first. And then once the ice-free corridor was opened up um, and could support life, that's a big one. It needed to support life. Um, more people are moving in. It's not just one migration. This is multiple migrations, but early, these early populations of, of the indigenous, there's not many. It's a couple hundred, maybe a couple thousand, if that. So once again, this Oceana one, really not happening. There's a little bit of evidence for it, but that's the solution hypothesis, absolutely not. It did not happen period. And I will argue with that. I will, I will stand on my grave for that one. And when it comes to indigenous oral traditions, what do, what do indigenous nations today say about it? Well, pretty much this, there was a time of giants and monsters, and you can relate that to these Pleistocene megafauna. These things were huge. 
And people remember that. The indigenous remember this. It's in a lot of oral traditions about deep time, as well as this time of darkness and cold, the Pleistocene. It is the ice age. It is cold. It is wet. Um, there's a Pawnee one, a oral tradition of deep time, talking about humans, about following the dragons back. And you just imagine the, you know, these glaciers are a mile high in some places. These things are huge. And you can see if they're blocking the Rockies, they're not blocking, you know, blocking the tops, the, the peaks are still up and you, you could be able to, could, you know, this is all theoretical, right? Or abstract, it could be, they're talking about the Rocky Mountains and following the Rocky Mountains, right? There's also deep chasms and deep ravines. It's going back to these, you know, the ice free corridor, those, those glaciers a mile high, that's, that's tall. Those are some pretty severe chasms and some ravines. And then of course, there's a lot, some tribes, especially on the West Coast, nations you know talk about flooding and water obstacles and using boat and that goes back to the to the maritime route hypothesis right the coastal highway so you know these things these stories which people think are just stories oh they're just using the term monsters oh it's a time of darkness they're just making this up it's like well if you look at these through a critical lens about really analyzing the history behind these things you can actually look at the archaeological data and what we know from the Pleistocene and be like, you know what, this actually kind of fits. And it's people trying to understand their world. It's a form of cultural relativism, right? They don't know what the Pleistocene is. They live it. Um, they're trying to explain the world around them. And that's how they do it. So that's peopling of the Americas. And now this is what I really wanted to get into in terms of Plains culture history. Looking at the Great Plains which is here, right, has these different regions and going from the first people all the way up to where the Pawnee are. So the general geographic divisions, you have the Northwest Plains, Northeastern Plains, Central Plains, and the Southern Plains. And this goes all the way up from Canada down to Texas. This is a huge geographic region. On the east, you have long grass prairie. In the center, you have uh, mid grass prairie or yeah, mid, yeah, mid height prairie. And on the, on the west, you have short grass. So tall, middle, short, okay? So we're gonna start off with the Paleo-Indian period. And looking at this pre-Clovis, Clovis time period, what are people doing when they get here? And this is a start of maybe around 13,000 BC. We don't really have evidence for pre-Clovis in the plains. And you know, most likely it's because Clovis people were the first to occupy the plains. Whereas pre-Clovis is on the West Coast because there's a, you know, a glacier separating the coast, right? And mountains. So this is what we kind of see in terms of radiocarbon, it's about like 1200 years, 1300 years. In terms of looking at population and time, we'll never find the earliest site. And if you flip this over, and this is in regards to all archeology, span you won't find the latest site. It's just a matter of statistics. Really Clovis in the plains is first. There's some argument with the Deborah Friedkin site in Texas and some weird sites, but there's no points, there's no bones. It's just weird looking rocks. Low population density. The ice age is ending. There's a lot of big game and there's no prolonged residence. These are hunting and gathering populations, right? So we don't really see it. And there's a number of different sites that show this and it's predominantly with might mastodon kills. Why is, do, you, do people associate um, mastodon or mammoth kills with Clovis? It's because it's really fundamentally easy to find a mammoth kill. They're big. And that's why you find them. But there's also Clovis caches, Clovis age caches, which are these bundles, tiny little bundles. I, I, bundles is probably the wrong term. There's all these raw materials, tools, points, whatever you need, and it's in a little package and they bury it and hide it. Those are you know, fundamentally harder to find purposely hidden objects that uh, people who buried them buried so they can come back to them if they needed them. Um, versus mastodon kills, right? Where they're not bearing the bones, they're on usually on the plains near, near water, they're getting covered, they're being preserved. It's just easier to find uh, mastodon kills, right? And there's variability. In the Northern Plains, you have people hunting caribou. It's not just mastodon and mammoth. This whole concept of big game hunters is kind of antiquated. But what's cool with the caches, right? You can actually track movement. Um, this one, the Mahaffey cache, which was found in Boulder, which um, my advisor excavated, you can hear some stones that were found within the cache and you can trace them back to their source. And it looks like you could see the path and where they collected it and traveled through the mountains and put it in Boulder and hit it. 
So you can see how people are moving by looking at the raw materials. So moving on, now we're, Clovis has ended. Now we're still in this Paleo-Indian period. So we have Folsom and late Paleo-Indian. And the projectile points are changing. In the Clovis period, there was just Clovis points. In Folsom, we start getting Folsom points and some others. Folsom points are a little bit smaller. We get Plainview, Scotts Bluff, Agate Basin. These are all in the plains. This is around 10,800 to 7,200 BC. And boy, oh boy. It's getting weird. The planet is getting warmer. The ice age is ending. We have this younger Dryas, and which is somewhat related, we believe, to um, basically these ice dams up in Canada, Hudson Bay breaking and releasing water and basically freezing the planet. And it, it's so the climate's weird. And the mastodon are gone, but bison aren't. Oh boy, bison are not gone. So this is an early Paleo-Indian bison, bison just after Paleo-Indian, and this is modern bison. They're getting smaller. And there's major changes, and this is a major subsistence strategy, especially in the plains. You have two different kinds of uh, bison hunting, communal, non-communal. Communal hunting takes a lot of energy. It has to be organized, and there's specific roles. Non-communal, small numbers, it can be cooperative, um, but you know it's not as intensive. And we can use the ethnographic record to figure things out about communal hunting in some of these sites. You know, we have. Um, bison drives and the crowds at the end if they don't break their necks on the bottom and then people shooting bows well you know later in time they're shooting bows earlier in time they're using um atlatls and you're wiping out whole herds high probability of success huge massive bison bone beds right like they just butcher the bison in place um and these places are used over time like there's repeat use sometimes through hundreds of years and non-communal you can think of this as small groups, slower yield. It's basically maybe a couple guys providing for their family, whereas this is providing for a tribe. And we can see, right, archaeologically, um, how do we know that they're long-term reuse sites? Well, if you excavate these sites and you see these layers of bison bones sticking out, those are different bison kill events. And the more spread out they are in the dirt, right, dirt takes a while to, to build up. These are different events happening at the same place. And you can see how intensive it is, right? Like these are all disarticulated bison. Mandibles are everywhere. People are really getting in there and chopping up the bison to get everything that they can. And when it comes to the communal practices, especially we have drive lines that are used over time. We can see these Karens. We're not really sure what they are. They could have been post fire. We don't, I, I really don't know. This is not kind of my area of expertise, but you can see where they're driving the bison. Bison have really bad vision. So if you get them running, uh, they can't see a cliff and then go over it. So you can see the processing area. Here's the drump. And then here's the drive lines that's forcing bison in. So this is a pretty sophisticated hunting method. People aren't just randomly walking out in the plains and looking for bison like idiots. This is sophisticated. This is planned. And this is happening 10, you know, 10,000 years ago. And then we kind of see what might be ritual leadership. I really don't like using that word, but something's going on here at the Cooper site. This bison skull is found kind of out of place. It's face down in an arroyo, this arroyo here. Um, and it has ochre on it, which is a form of paint, red paint. It's not just like degrading rust and it has these marks on it. We're not totally sure, but something weird's going on at the copper site. Cooper site, it's fulsome. There's three kills in this single arroyo. Basically they wedged them in there and at the end um, massacred these bison herds. And you know, these aren't disarticulated, right? It's limited. They're left in place, so they're basically getting the prime cuts of meat or whatever they can and then leaving. And this will change, and especially it will change in the archaic. Points are starting to get smaller, right? So this period without pottery, we're basing these assumptions on people based on the types of arrowheads they made. It's really not a good method, but for this, this is the best we have. Uh, projectile points are getting smaller, and there's more variation. And in the early archaic, it's this ultrathermal climate. It's getting hot and dry. And actually the plains are spreading, the prairie maximum. So especially in the Southern Plains, things are getting worse, but the prairie is expanding. And this has impacts on bison and, re and human responses, especially because there's two major droughts during here. And we can see this. 
so there starts being differences in how people are across the plains are hunting bison. So we have roasting features here, which we'll get to bison kills that are small. And in the Northern Plains, these dominant, you know, bison dominated large kills, these mass kill effects. And we can see these, you know, we have um, drive lanes here in Rocky National Park at the Hawkins site. We can see, look, you can even see where the bison were running based on the, on the skulls. They're all facing um, west. So this is where they died in place. And you can see, you know, the vertebrae kind of match up and they're left in place. Um, and this is head smashing in Alberta. This is a largely famous bison jump where they ran them over the edge. And actually the Ojibwe, I think, is it the Ojibwe? Whoever, whoever, whichever, and I, and I apologize, whichever nation runs this, they actually say head smashed in isn't here. It's actually a different one that the archaeologists got it wrong, but that's not here or there. And then so moving to the middle archaic, 30, 3,800 to 1,200. People are still killing bison, don't get me wrong, but things are changing. We're starting to see more of these roasting pits. So basically, if you think about sweat, you know, you, you heat up those rocks and we have, we can see these. Here's the hearth at these sites. You can see where they're, where they're cooking the rocks. And then they put these at the bottom. They cover the rocks with hide, pour water in there, and then they're throwing bones into these um, features these these boiling pits and basically if you throw these bones in the marrow comes out bone grease and you can scoop it off the top and this really looks like pemmican making um berries when we talk about pemmican that's a historical thing we really think this is not really this is a well sorry go back um this is really uh, a mountain man thing because this was such a bland meal and it's easy to transport. Once you have pemmican, it's good for two to three years. If anyone who knows on the plains knows what pemmican is, it's actually delicious. And so we're really starting to see this life way through these stone boiling pits and experimental archaeology, which is going on here. And we're also seeing uh, the medicine wheels show up and mortuary sites, right? So bighorn medicine wheel possibly middle archaic and why do we you know we can't date stones but what we can do is look at the artifacts associated you know that are in these these sites and they're coming from the middle archaic to the late archaic and this is based off of the different projectile points you can think of projectile points like um phones it's kind of that same you know you all you, the, you have the old timey graham bell one talking like this and now we have all these different brands and the projectile points are the same way they're constrained within space and time. So you could think of them like different brands of phones and we can tell how old they are. Um, so this is where we're getting this idea of when the medicine wheels are showing up or when these Karens are showing up. And we have you know, the medicine wheels in Wyoming um, as well as Canada and some of these Karens. And this is all coming out in the archaic period. So really what I'm showing you guys going through this in depth is like how that we can see change through time in the plains and how people are coming or adapting to the environment. So we got possibly different social units, distinct populations showing up. People are putting time and effort into mortuary practices or ritual practices. And this is not all throughout the same region. Um, you know, people might be, instead of wandering around the plains, they might be focusing on one region, like their territory, territory, right? And so we start seeing these structures on the plains. And so we're seeing this change and people are becoming more attached to a specific location. And during the late archaic, you know, this isn't necessarily the plains, but this is going to be huge. We start seeing pottery and pottery, pottery is pretty big. This comes with a huge change in life ways across the globe. Um, you know, up here, we start seeing it in the Missouri. So this is, this is plains times or plains area. And we also start seeing new artifacts, new objects show up with this, with this late archaic. So it's not just projectile points anymore. It's not just bone kills, kill sites. We're starting to see evidence of axes, hoes, pestles, mono matates, ornaments. People are staying there for longer. And what are mono matates and pestles, pestles are good for? Agriculture, grain, grinding food. We don't have you know, grain in, in the Americas, maize. Something's happening here. There's a shift. And also mortuary practices. Um, don't worry, I won't show human remains. I, I don't do that, but I'll show some diagrams. 
and in, and in Alberta, some of these Karens, we can see some intensive burial practices, right? And the way you bury your dead is really indicative of your culture and of your identity. We still have large scale bison hunting in Northern Northwestern Plains. Um, basically the intensity of carcass processing a bison is becomes more intensive um, the further south you get. And people are still practicing hunting and gathering from paleo Indian times, but there's a shift on the Eastern Plains. And there's a lot of local variation that looks very similar to the East. And this is where things really change. So basically, you know, for 13,000 years, 11, you know, 1,200, 12,500 years, people are hunting and gathering. It's bison, they're moving on the landscape, but the woodland, this changes. Pottery shows up, burial mound construction. Pottery show is really tied to people staying in one place for longer because these things are fragile and pots take time and you don't want to carry your pot. I mean, you know, there's no horses, right? Um, these are fragile, you're staying in the same place. And this is really starting to show up on um, the Eastern Plains. Maize hasn't shown up yet. You know, maize, what we know now is corn. It comes from Mesoamerica. The, the ancestral form is teosinte. Um, it takes a while for teosinte and maize to become um, used to Northern climates because it is a Mesoamerican crop. And basically people force it to live in the plains and it takes a while, but we're not quite there yet. So there's other domesticates like goosefoot, um, marsh elder, some of these other plants that we don't eat today. This was a staple of domestication back, back in these times. We have some issues with plains woodland. Um, it appears later than Eastern woodland. And we'll, you know, that's not part of this. There's some calibration issues with the radiocarbon curve. Um, and still, you know, across the plains, it's not like it was one huge switch, right? No one just hit a switch and said, okay, we're now we're woodland people. This took a while. So the earliest expressions of this woodland type of living start in the east and they kind of slowly move out. So woodland, it, you really, it, we know it kind of starts around 500 BC around this time, but it starts in the east and it slowly moves out, but people are still kind of doing archaic life ways, right? And that's a big thing as I've, as I've talked, there's no real switch. It, it's kind of a gray area of people changing their lifestyles. And here we go to the middle woodland. Um, this is big. Kansas City Hopewell pops up and look how gorgeous these pots are. Inside pottery, polished. This is around Kansas City. <sighs> Lots of bone needles, um, earrings, different projectile points. And these are found in residential areas. People are staying put. People aren't moving across the landscape anymore. We're talking about people are starting to adopt agriculture and they're staying in the same place. And these burial mounds get really elaborate. And it looks like there was cremation within these tombs. And we'll see how this affects later. So we have, you know, here, we're no, now we're starting to look into the central plains, guys. Kansas City Hopewell is about AD one to, you know, 500. And there's these kind of pot middle, these woodland complexes start showing up that show somewhat relation to KC, Kansas City Hopewell, but not terribly. And these are kind of these divisions that we're starting to see. Projectile points are getting smaller, they're triangular. They look like um, they might still be atlatls. It could be bow technology, not quite sure. And these are indicative of woodland pots, they're conical. Um, the reason why they, these are shaped this way, it really looks like, because you can't lay them on the bottom here, you kind of bury them into the ground like a roasting pit. So you have uh, rocks or a fire underneath and you kind of stick the pot in there. And it's actually really good for um, rendering fat, bison fat. Kind of, it's a transformative version of those, of uh, those cooking pits, those, those, those rendering pits that we talked about in the archaic. And we're starting to see houses. So at the Schultz site, Wallace site, um, these are still not permanent. Um, they're semi-permanent. They're not earth lodges. They're, we don't know if they're teepees, right? Because, you know, in the archaeological record, you don't, they, you know, the, the hides, the wood doesn't stay. You see the post holes. So a lot of times when we're trying to figure out what's going on up top, we're, it, we're trying to use best guess or educated guess. 
And it looks like at some of these sites, because you'll get multiple rings, right? They might not be all contemporary. So it might just be people coming back to the same place throughout time. And, you know, so here's Kansas City Hopewell again, and these are kind of some of these indicative artifacts, right? So houses are kind of showing up, not really. They're semi-permanent, definitely in Kansas City, and we still got TPs going on up here. And you still have TPs down here, what, you know, campsites. Um, and pottery is making its way up to Canada. So people are starting to adapt. They're starting to really decrease their range and stay in the same place, and they're bound by, by regions. Late woodland is another transition period. We're starting to see more pottery show up. It's starting to get smaller, a little bit globular. This is Plains Village, this will come up later. Um, they're really durable and, and thermal efficient. Um, you know, we don't see painted pots like you do in the Southwest, but some of the, pot, the pots that you do get on the plains, they might not be as visually appeasing. They're visually appeasing in a different way. And a lot of times they're thinner than Southwestern pottery by a lot. We're also seeing more in, in, in late plains woodland, people are starting to settle down a little bit more. Maze shows up, might be like small gardens or they're coming back to it. It's in really small qualities, but it's not the major cash crop yet. We still have some mound construction going on. The decorations, the ceramics kind of disappear, which is weird. And the Kansas City Hopewell population start dispersing. Um, but, you know, we still have bison hunting going on. It's pretty much still doing some of that archaic stuff. Um, and we still have indicative woodland style hunter gatherers in, in the plains, but really on the Eastern plains is where we see more settlement. And this is where we start seeing how do, you know, this is, this is supposed to be a conversation about the Pawnee, right? Like this is supposed to be Pawnee history. Well, all this is our history. But this is where we can start really applying, really seeing our oral traditions in action the Pawnee oral traditions, the Ricker oral traditions, the Wichita oral traditions, and really start pairing them with the archeological record or contributing you know, back and forth being used at the same. This is the Plains Village period. This is where we see settled villages and towns. And I, you know, I hate the term villages, especially for Plains Village. Cause you know, especially Pawnee, Arikara, Mandan, Hidatsa, these are towns. We're talking about a couple hundred people up to a couple thousand. Village, not so much. Corn's being squashed, three sisters, boom. Early, we have horticultural, not total agriculture, and this is globule pot pottery. And on this eastern edge, right, of the plains, we start seeing Oneota folks. There's a little bit of this late woodland style. These people are kind of coming in from, from the east to the west. They're related to Cahokia, which I didn't have time to talk about in, in this. They're settling farmers in these parts of Iowa. Their houses are rectangular. And this is what their pottery looks like. These, uh, their shoulders are decorated in some Mississippian fashions. And they have a pretty complex tool assemblage. Um, lips are weird. Um, and these people are connected to the Mississippians and a little bit to Spyro, but not as much. But are these related to the Pawnee, these Oneodans? No. Um, their main, can what this population mainly contributes to, because, you know, we can't think of, prehistoric people, not, not even prehistoric, we can't even think of people moving out as discrete units through time. Um, people move, they change, they marry, they move around. So these forms of identity we can't really see in the past, but around this time, there's co these cultural continuities. These people here, they really become the Ponca in Omaha. And they weren't here first. And so before we get into more Pawnee kind of archaeology, I want to, there's this really specific oral tradition, once again, shout out to Roger, about our closed man ceremony or closed man story that talks about specifically the Skeedy Federation was founded, you know, a place near Genoa along uh, Wild Licorice Creek or Beaver Creek. Um, but before this, this happened, right, the, the, the Skeedy, which before colonization, we we're talking about a minimum 13 clans that had their own towns. Before we had earth lodges, they lived in these square shaped structures and hamlets. So this is before the earth lodge. And what do we see? Well, coming back to these really Pawnee earth, uh, some of these oral traditions, we're not between the four different bands, between the different clans and between the different families, there's a lot of different stories, which makes sense because the Pawnee are a culmination of people throughout space and time that have come together to say, we are Pawnee, right? So there's one story um, talks about 
coming from the land of stone houses in the Southwest. We have no idea where this is. There's this migration east and near the big timbers, the cross of the big timbers, the Arikara say, we, we split off from the Pawnee in, in Wichita and we went north and we settled along the upper Republican river. The Skeedy, Wichita and South Bands migrated north along um, the Mississippi River. Then the Skeedy split off to go live with the Arikaras, kind of replaced them. The Arikaras kind of moved north and the South Bands in Wichita show up. At some point, the Wichita split off. I'm not totally sure when. I haven't really investigated it, but I'd really, that's, you know, one of our big questions is like, okay, where do we see the Wichita specifically? Or what really contributes to the Wichita? And then they kind of go back down south. But they say, you know, we went up to Nebraska with these guys and the differentiation is how long did they stay? And this is really Pawnee. This is what's called the Central Plains tradition. Remember the clothes man story about square houses? Here it is. Small hamlets, yep. A little bit of maze, yep. And they're in a lot of the traditional territory of the historic Pawnee. Um, Itskari, I, I'd hedge my bets that that's ancestral Skidi. Itskari means, you know, a loop river in, in Skidi Pawnee. A lot of Pawnee towns are over some of these CPT sites, um, big town where all the Pawnees got together for the reservation, the Skeety said, no, we're gonna go live here because this is an ancestral place of ours. And it's right on top of a CPT house. You know, the Upper Republican, that's where the Arikaras say they went to first. And guess what's the first Central Plains tradition phase to show up? Upper Republican, right? Um, Nebraska phase has a lot of relations to some of these South Band stories about the Kauracas, the, the ancestors. So there's a lot going on. And these phases aren't phases through time. They're really just geographic expressions, but there is some fighting going on uh, at some points, but it's not just here. These are the core areas, but all throughout Eastern Wyoming, Eastern Colorado look like campsites and hunting sites for these populations. And this is where they're getting their stone too. You can, there's some good stone sources here in, in Kansas, but the Itzkari populations are getting stone out of the Hartville uplift in, in Western Wyoming. And a lot of our oral traditions, the Pawnee oral traditions, like talk about Colorado, Wyoming, right? You know, Tuspe. Um, we have we have names for Long's Peak, Pike's Peak. We have Pawnee words for those. Like we, that's within our geography, our cultural geography is well within there. Um, and you know, in this, with the Pawnee scouts in later times, there are stories about how older men would take the young guys who have only grown up on the res, they'd go on a hunting trip and they just disappear. And these older guys would take these younger hunters or scouts out to some of these sacred places in Wyoming and Colorado to, for that cultural continuity. So the big thing is the farming is really spreading up the Missouri River. So these populations, right? It's, we see Upper Republican first, just barely, Steed Kisker in Nebraska. It's coming up the Missouri River and then it's spreading out. And they're not really along the rivers, they're in like river drainages practicing horticulture. So small scale, these are hamlets, right? You know, those Oneota folks that I talked about earlier, um, they're interacting with each other. So there's some CPT sites with Oneoto on top and vice and, you know, primarily. And you can see the pottery is so distinctive that you can trace it. Um, there's really no, no Oneota sites, pure Oneota sites in terms of their square houses, their Oneota pottery. These are Dingan speaking Suins, ancestral Dingan speaking Suins. They don't have CPT pottery. But there's Cadoan sites, the Central Plains tradition sites, which are Cadoan square houses, everything that's associated with ancestral Cadoans. They have Oneota shirts, but they're locally made. So they're interacting. They might be seeing their pots and trying to um, copy them. And this is around late 1200s, 1300s. And we still have a lot of work to do um, with that. And there's some pure, pure sites. Yeah, but there's also some conflict. There's an Oneota occupation here. And a lot of these sites are, have... Oneota and CPT violence. So they didn't always get along. Now here's the fun part. We're going to go to the Plains Village period, the middle part, 1300 to 1500 AD. Back to the oral traditions, our old traditions talking, you know, these green question marks, where are the Wichita? We don't know. But our oral traditions, the Eureka and Pawnee are talking about, we left Nebraska for a bit. We went north along the Missouri River and where we were still together, right? And what do we see along this period? 
and then you know we migrate out the Arikara go into South Dakota the pond the Skeety Pawnee really central Nebraska South fans along here and what's going on around that 1,350 now 1,300 period drought pretty severe droughts and when you are growing maize you need water because maize is a very thirsty plant so what happens well we're going to use the lynch site as a as an example the lynch site is what we call initial coalescent variant site it is in northeastern nebraska um, it is on a place that's old places in terrace um, you know there's a reason why the people of lynch our ancestors lived on the terrace well the people of lynch today found out why they don't they shouldn't have a town there because a year ago it got completely flooded during the really bad um ice storms that that really ravaged the midwest for a while what's here the site is over a mile long it is huge the three houses that have been excavated, they're CPT, it's CPT pottery, CPT lifeways, but there's Oneota stuff present too. We haven't found an Oneota house. And what's really, really interesting about this is the blending. So this is a typical Oneota pot, right? This is a typical CPT pot. Within the same house, they're finding both. They're both locally made. And I wish I totally forgot a picture. They ended up blending the styles. So Oneota pots, the shoulders are decorated. And CPT pots, the rims are decorated. They end up blending the two to make these hybrid forms. It becomes what they call lynchware. And this is one of the earliest uh, initial coalescent variant sites. So it's no longer CPT, but it's CPT people moving away from the hamlets and moving into these. This site's a mile, a mile long. That is a lot of people, right? Um, so there's a change and it's, it persists whistling elk. This is most likely a Ricara. Once again, it is CPT farmers, but instead of with the mixing with the Oneota stuff, they're really taking some of these middle Missouri people. So these are um, Mandan Hidatsa. We start seeing earth lodges, proto earth lodges. They're, they're, they're rounded, they're larger. They're kind of this in-between of a traditional Pawnee and a Ricara earth lodge and these waddle and daub CPT houses. We're seeing this transformation. Um, the Mandan and Hidatsa were not a fan of proto Arikaras, proto Pawnees, whatever you want to call them, showing up. These are earth lodges. These are fortifications. This was a double fortified. 40 to 70 houses. Whistling Elk was burned to the ground. And it goes back and forth. There are these middle Missouri sites which are mandan hadatsa so there there's massacres taking place and these massacres coincide with because uh, we can date when these palisades were burnt down they date with periods of climatic stress it's hot people are fighting over resources they're raiding villages to get corn and killing everybody um this is where we see interpersonal violence before this throughout plains warfare which will be a lecture i hope someday soon later Plains warfare consisted of a group of men, think 300, Spartan hoplites, but without the bronze shields, they were hide shields, lances, shield walls, shooting arrows across at each other until enough, someone takes enough hits, they leave. That was plains warfare. When you get to this period in time, you know, 1300s, 1500s, it's clubs, it's axes, it's interpersonal. And this also, we can see this in the rock art. We can see these changes. It's, it's big group battles. Um, you still have the lances, you still have the hide shields, but it's getting very personal. And this happens a couple times. You have whistling elk. Um, you also have uh, Crow Creek. That's a big one. Um, and then you see some of these middle Missourians, these ancestral um, Hidatsa and Mandans are also getting burned. One is, well, I forget one side is kind of coined uh, Crow Creek's Revenge which it looks like are these Cadoan ancestors. I use the term Cadoan, which I haven't explained. Pawnee, Arikara, and Wichita are part of the Cadoan language family. So when I say Cadoans, I mean ancestral to these groups. They came and they got revenge. Um, and then we start, so we have this period of us living here, adopting the Earth Lodge, and then we start going back, where we see the traditional homelands of the historic nations of the Pawnee, Arikara, and Wichita. I still don't know what's going on with them. I need to look into it, I know. So now we're starting to get contact. This is contact colonial. This is where we're around 1500. This is where everyone's at. Mandan and Dotsa Rick are moving up. We're over here, Wichita are down here. You know, the Wichita are a federation of several different tribes. 
Um, we have the Caddo, part of the Caddoan language family, which it's named after. They're distant relatives. And this is the Dingan speaking Siouxans. You know, we don't have the Lakotas showing up quite yet. They're kind of late to the game. But this is the Kaws, Ponkas, Iowas, Omaha. That's who's here. And this is when we see what we, when we think and imagine of Pawnee before Europeans, it's really around 1450, 1500. Does that mean that Central Plains tradition people and the people, the woodland people before that aren't Pawnee? No. Of, or, well, yeah, no, they're, they are, right? Because there was steps to lead us here. There was so much cultural change that dates back. We have oral traditions dating back to the Ice Age, right? We have been here. And it's our culture history. It's part of our history of hunting bison in a million different ways, subsisting off the plains in a bunch of different ways. We have overcome drought. We've overcome uh, adversity for 13,000 years. And this is when we start seeing what we think of as Pawnee. This is, and this is when people started thinking of themselves as Pawnee. They brought their traditions with them from the past. They held on to these oral traditions. This is when we're starting seeing the huge villages. This is when we start seeing true earth lodges. These are towns, right? Um, and actually, as a matter of fact, something extremely cool about earth lodges, they're the perfect anti-tornado architecture for the plains. If you look at the distribution of earth lodges and you look at Tornado Alley, they map on perfectly because these suckers are, they're not just... They're, architecturally, these things are a feat of engineering. These things are tornado proof, right? And so, yeah, think of when people call Pawnee's primitive or we're simple. Yeah, well, we built houses that can stand tornadoes. You know, talk to the Oklahomans, Kansas and Nebraskans who lose their house almost every fall, right? Adapting to the environment. And this is our Pawnee pottery. And this is really cool because it is this blend. You can see, um, you can, you can see pottery styles from like CPT and Odiota, these, these raptor looking wing things that we, they're starting to get more sophisticated. Um, corn's being squashed, still hunting bison. And, you know, we're going, if you look at Pawnee, where Pawnee's hunted bison historically, it is the same place the Central Plains tradition folks were hunting bison. And before that, the woodland people. That stuff has persisted through thousands of years. So although the technology has changed, our life ways have changed, there's still these same practices and knowledge of place that has persisted. And that's kind of the really big focus I want to get to people. It's, we can, we can see this. And our, if you use the oral traditions, right? Um, people since the 90s and 80s have been talking about who are the ancestors of the Pawnee. And it wasn't until really I took it as my master's thesis to be like, what do the Pawnee oral traditions say? How do they match up? And they matched up great. And it's been fun and I've had a lot of support. Every now and then on Facebook, you get that annoying photo that says, this is where plain, this is where tribal boundaries were. Um, I hate it. Why do I hate it? Because it's not accurate. And the reason why it's not accurate. So this is Indian tribes in 1650. The one that you're used to seeing on Facebook, which I'll show, I think I show, is from the 1800s. The central plains by the time of Spanish contact was Cadoans, Arikara, Pawnee, Wichita's, all these guys that, that are us. We might have fought, we might have had different, the Cados were doing crazy stuff with mounds back here in Oklahoma. They're really cool, huge, large centers. Um, we have oral traditions that tie us to Cahokia. I did get to talk about it, but like when you talk about really Plains nations, the Cados are there, the Cadoans are there. That's, that's us, right? Um, this is short grass prairie, mid grass prairie, or short grass, mid grass, long grass. No, so when you really think of plains people, Cadoans are one of the oldest people that can say, no, this is, this is us, right? And, you know, people are used to saying Lakotas and Sioux here. They're not here yet. Apaches aren't here yet. The Comanches haven't split off from the Shoshones yet. That happens later. And a lot of the movement West, right, where, the, where other groups are starting to come in, that's a direct result of English colonization. That's not ancestral traditional territories. So this used to be, you know, a free range, you know, this was a hunting grounds. Getting into the historic record, this is where we really start seeing when, pe when Pawnees are mentioned and Cadoans in the archaeological record. We have Spanish incursions. I don't know if people know about this. You know who stopped the Spanish from getting to the East Coast? It was Pawnees and Wichita's. 
we stopped the Spanish colonization of the plains. The Villasar expedition, which we which we talked, or we had just had the anniversary of this. There's a hide painting that shows what's going on. It's us in, in Wichita's, I think, or was it Omaha's? Maybe one of the Dingan sewers are there. Matt can tell us later. We massacred these people. They show up with like a hundred um, conquistadors, like a couple hundred Pueblo auxiliaries, and like almost no one made it back. So, you know, we weren't just, we didn't just like roll over. We, this is a part of history that I wish that I really want more Pawnees to realize, like who stopped the Spanish, who kept the Spanish in the Southwest. It's like Pawnees and Wichita's and some of the other ding and sewer speakers, some big battles occurred. So why does this all matter? Right? Like why, why am I having this, this talk? Why is the Pawnee nation museum hosting this? And this kind of goes back to these preconceived notions of what archaeology is to the minds of indigenous peoples today, right? It's a colonial science. It's done bad things to us in the past. And I agree, but it can change. And what's one of the big ways? It's this thing, it's indigenous archaeology that has come really out of um, NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Repatriation Act, Protections and Repatriation Act. And we've seen an explosion of more indigenous people getting in anthropology. And that, and they're making change with within, right? Like it, it's kind of the same with how many lawyers do you know in Indian country? Well, back in like the early seventies, right? There was only a couple and then they it just exploded and we've used the legal system to our benefit. And we're seeing the same mirror happen in anthropology and especially archeology span where there's more indigenous archeologists and archeology span is becoming more collaborative not consultative, right? Consultative, sorry, not consultative, consultative. Indigenous archeology span is an approach to archeology span that is for, by, and with indigenous peoples and in interpreting the archeological span record. That's by George Nicholas. Um, we have volumes on it. Joe Watkins, um, I think he's Choctaw. He's the president of the Society of American Archeologists. That's over 10,000, he represents over 10,000 archeologists and he's indigenous. Um, this decolonizing methods, she's from New Zealand and is helping this whole thing out. It was really the start of it. This is from 1989. So we're seeing this huge approach. And I've been very fortunate where I work that I've had Roger Echo Hawk work in the 90s and early 2000s with archaeologists. He paved the way for me because I can, you know, I, I've never, I've, I have very fond memories when I met um, Rob Bozell and Bob Horde, the state archaeologists of Nebraska and Kansas, who have been so extremely supportive of my work. And that's not how it is for many indigenous archaeologists. On the plains, surprisingly, it's pretty supportive. And this whole collaborative approach is really taking storm. I'm, I'm working with the University of Colorado Boulder on the Chop and Mesa Museum renovation program, which is the museum at Mesa Verde. I am not Southwestern, you know, indigenous on plains, um, but the indigenous death chart in my department is a little short. We got a couple, but they just brought us all out. But at CU Boulder, the museum program and archeologists, Crow Canyon Archeological Institute, the Mesa Verde National Park and over 20 descendant communities. And we as this huge group have, have started this whole process of how do we want this museum to move forward. It's not asking indigenous people after the fact, like, hey, I did this research, what do you think about it? I really don't care about your answer because I'm gonna do it anyway. It's really keeping indigenous people involved from the beginning and being a part of the process, right? That's this collaborative approach. If you wanted to hear more specifically about Pawnee oral traditions and Arikara oral traditions and really looking at that mid to late plain village period, um, I highly recommend, I did two talks. They're kind of the same talk. Um, they're on both on YouTube, about an hour long. Uh, this was for the Indian Peaks chapter of Colorado Archaeological Society. And actually this is a talk I did last year for the Pawnee Nation on, I think this day, I think it's the year anniversary. Yeah, like a year ago today, I did this talk. Um, so if you want to know more about Pawnee and Arikara oral traditions, go to this um, when you guys have time. And this is really a slice of time from 950 to 1650. And, and moving forward with this indigenous archaeology, um, I'm really adamant about it. So adamant that myself and a colleague, Emily Von Alts, who's Lakota, we are co co-editing, we're co-authoring this edited volume called Indigenizing Archaeology. We have 11 different nations represented. 
Plains Cree, uh, Nipmuc Nation, Pomo, Pueblo, White Mountain Apache, Wandok, Crow, Potawatomi, Red Lake Ojibwe, PD, Lakota, and of course, Pawnee. These are all rising archaeologists, you know, early professionals, early career archaeologists. And this edited volume, which will come out next year, is methods. It's like, how do you actually do indigenous archaeology? Not the theory, not how you should, not like why you should do it, but this is how you do it step by step. And this is meant for college students, TIPOs, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, NAGPRA officers, and tribal archaeologists. It's not meant, it's meant for the everyday person. It's not meant for high flute archaeologists. We don't care. They're lost. We want new people to take this mantle. And more importantly, why does this matter? Why am I giving this presentation? The Pawnee Nation is moving to get a new cultural center. We have a museum. I don't know if you've been around it. We could do better. And we paired up with Oklahoma State, the architects program. And this is one of the things they came up with, designs that we liked. We need to change the interior. We really need to change the interior. Because where's all these, these pots I showed you, the corn, the bison, where is this stuff? It's not with us. Nebraska, Kansas, Chicago, New York, Colorado. Our cultural history is not in our possession. And that's one of the parts of this cultural center, not only to hire or to have a full-time cultural staff for language, but also to bring our objects back to the people. Because having, having our young, our, our, our elders or young kids work with part of their past, it's an experience. It's almost a spiritual experience. Every time I'm excavating um, and I find something, I can't help but wonder how this, how it was made, you know, having a piece of that history is really important and to give Pawnee people that experience, that tangible experience with their past that can go back thousands of years. I think it's really important. And this is kind of part of this cultural center um, and to have funding for it. And we're working on it. You know, we're right now we're working on grants so we can hire someone to do this full time, but this is part of what we want, you know, to really have a place back in Pawnee where Pawnees can gather and see, not have to go to Chicago, New York, DC, to see their history piece by piece, or even London. The British Museum has a lot of Pawnee stuff um, and we wanna bring it home, bring it home to the people. It might, we not, might not be in Nebraska anymore, but at least have a place where Pawnees can look at their history, their material history through thousands of years. And before I go, I wanna go back to the Lynch site real quick. We are going to be excavating hopefully this summer if COVID's not happening. This, this is where I work in the summer. Um, this site is probably one of the last times the Arika and Skeety Pawnee were together. Okay. And we've had last year, we had uh, Matt Reed, the TIPO, Marty Only, a chief or NAGPRA officer, as well as Patsy Cooper from the Pawnee Nation Museum Board come and visit. And both of my advisors think it's extremely important to have more Pawnees show up. And we, if this happens and you guys are interested in, in coming to one of our ancestral sites, um, this summer we're gonna, there will be an invite for Pawnees to show up. There's, there's hotels and stuff around, um, but we really wanna get more Pawnees out there to see an active excavation that's not, you know, we don't dig up people. We do not dig up people. No one digs up people anymore. That's a huge no-no. We don't do it. I wouldn't do it. This is looking, trying to find houses and more pots. So I want to let everyone know that this is um, still happening and you can come to these sites. It's over a mile long. We have a lot to dig. We have a lot to dig. Um, I think, yeah, we dug this past summer, we dug here and almost found nothing because it's been sheltered out. Um, I was really worried that I was gonna go for an hour and a half and I didn't. So I wanna thank everybody for joining me tonight um, for this talk. Um, and we're, we're hoping in the future that we, the Pawnee Nation Museum can have, the Museum of the Pawnee Nation, sorry, can have future talks, uh, maybe monthly or every other month to talk about more of our culture, not just archeology, span but to, to talk about language and some of our cultural practices. Um, Cause this was, I condensed a semester long course into an hour. So I skipped over a lot of really cool stuff. We didn't even talk about Mesa Verde and Chaco and Spyro and Cahokia, which have some major influences on what's going on in the plains. So I hope this was interesting. I didn't bore you too much. And I would um, like, to, like to open this up for, for questions if you have them.
Anybody at all? Are we doing audio or typing it into the chat? Uh, you could, you, yeah, you can do audio. That's totally fine. If you want to type in the chat, whichever, whichever is up. Um, what kind of information is there on uh, when the pipe comes in? Pipe. Look, excellent question. We have, we found a, a pipe at Lynch, but we find, um, so that's like around 1300. Um, but we really see pipe manufacturing coming out of the Missouri with Cahokia. So around St. Louis, um, these effigy pipes that are really coming in. Um, and the pipes that we find, there are Central Plains tradition pipes. They're locally made. Um, so we really start seeing pipe ceremonies or the origins. Well, what we associate with pipe ceremonies, these origins of pipes really around um, 800 AD up to, um, you know, historic times. Uh, Amy asked, what is the 2021 research goal for excavations at Lynch? Um, and that is to find a house. That is the goal. Um, we didn't find one last year. We found a bunch of plowed over pits, um, but we're trying to find an actual house floor. That's, that's the goal for 2021. Wonderful lecture. Thank you so very much. Thank we you, Dr. Fuller. Learn from you. And can we have an invite to visit you at Lynch in summer? Absolutely. I'm sure me and uh, sure we'd love to have you, Dr. Fuller. And thank oh. you so much for sending me those old planes volumes. I really appreciate that. I appreciate it. this is this is the smarter Professor <laughs> Fuller right there. Hello, ma'am. Uh, and, the, and the prettier. Yeah, the prettier one too. <laughs> so we'll we'll come talk with you about uh, Steve Kisker and Tokyo and yes. Penn City Hopewell. That's Absolutely. What we spend a lot of time doing. Wonderful so summarization. Much. Wonderful. Bravo. I was I was freaking out. I had over 120 slides at one point, and I was just having to cut things back and forth and condense it. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys joining tonight. You did a great job. Oh, thank you, sir. Bravo. Okay. Any anybody else? It could be really. It doesn't just have to be to the lecture. If you have just general questions or. Even if you want to argue about something, if someone wants to go Southern Baptist, the world's 6,000 years old, let's duke it out. I'll ask you a relatively difficult question. Okay. Um, for the people in this room who aren't archaeologists, um, thinking about like labeling people groups and geographical groups and temporal groups based on ceramic types or projectile point types, why do archaeologists do that? Like why do changes in shapes and sizes and orientations of projectiles or ceramics, why do we associate that with changes in people? Right, so big thing is pots aren't people, neither are arrowheads, right? These are diagnostic artifacts. We can see differences. And we can, we assume, you know, if you tie in the form of the pot, the style of the pot with the settlement pattern, right? How the houses are formed, what's going on. You use these multiple lines of evidence, really not to see social groups, but to see these material culture groups. And it isn't until, you know, the late historic that we really kind of can say, okay, these guys are most likely this, this group, because it's very similar to the historic time. It's difficult. You know, we're not really sure what the relationship is to projectile points. Later in time, um, around the time of contact, those triangular side notch or corner notch points are ephemeral. Like they're not ephemeral, pretty much the same from Canada down to Southern Texas. And it's like, well, you can't base that off of, right? But in terms of the paleo Indian period, the archaic period, that's what we have. Those are our diagnostic artifacts. And so a lot of times they're they're bounded by geo by geography, so it's it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Any any last minute? Okay. Um, I have one. Uh, what kept people from uh, tying? Central Plains tradition to Pawnee before you started looking into it? So people had, in a, in a couple of places, it said it's most likely related. Um, Archaeology is not about, you know, truth. It's about probability. So people didn't really want to make that connection because um, once you kind of hit those firm, firm boundaries, you can get kind of caught up. Um, people had mentioned it. They'd suggested it. Like, it's most likely CPT. 
um, based on the cultural continuity um, in terms of, you know, some of those, those early ICV sites have CPT pot, late CPT pottery and then the housing. So everyone was pretty sure. Um, but when I brought in our oral traditions and said, our oral traditions lay onto this perfectly, this is ancestral Pawnee. And people, it, it's been a pretty big success, I would think. Um, I hope I've had a lot of people ask about it and support. Um, so that was kind of it. People were just kind of hesitant to do so. They just didn't want to stake their, you know, really, you know, that wasn't a hill they wanted to die on academically. Um, and then Sam said, what would participation at Lynch look like? We do, we do have volunteers. Um, it would be up to the, the site directors really on what kind of um, participation uh, is involved with that. Usually, you know, if you're paying for yourself, it's totally fine. Um, in terms of like just, you know, feeding yourself, housing yourself, we're, we're open to it. It just depends on how many students we have and, you know, what our availability is to help people out with excavating. I'm curious to know what Rob Bozell thinks about this presentation. He's the state archaeologist in Nebraska, and I'm sure he has, has some, some comments. You got to unmute yourself first, Rob. Uh, I was just typing, great job, Carlton, and I mean it sincerely. Um, my big thought is I can retire now. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 that was really good. Um, uh, and I, I look forward to, you know, kind of working with you and help whenever I can to refine this. I, you know, mm -hmm. we've talked a lot about, I still think there's some fuzzy areas in that 1500, 1600. Yeah. I don't, I don't know where the party really are there. I, I kind of feel they're still up in South Dakota, but that's, you know, that's, that's nuanced little stuff. I, 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 I applaud what you're doing. Um, I like, you know, this, I hadn't really heard much about this cultural center that you guys are working on. And I think that's wonderful. And like you said, we got a lot of Pawnee stuff in our collections and, you know, a lot of it's not on display. So there's no reason it shouldn't be on display someplace else where people are going to see it. So, you know, um, I just think you're doing a great job and, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's, I, I, there's nothing, there was nothing that he said that I, that I would disagree with. I think there's a lot of stuff we need to kind of figure out. The whole stone house thing has always sort of bothered me. Yeah. You know, if, if you know if they're living in stone houses, well, then I mean they can't be down in Mexico and up here, you know. And, and mm -hmm. I also wonder about you know there's these kind of stony houses down in Texas and Oklahoma uh, mm -hmm. in, the pan, in the panhandle of Texas that I can't remember what it's called. Matt, Is that a Pishapa stuff, right? No, no, it's buried city complex or something wow it's up in the texas panhandle and, okay. and there, antelope creek yeah like yeah antelope <clears throat> creek exactly these square houses and it's almost like they look like little pueblo and things you know that, mm. anyway uh lots of detail to kind of work out but you know you're doing great man i appreciate Thanks. it and, you know, Rob hit on a great point. We don't know everything about the archaeological record. It's not 100% done. And archaeology is, is destructive. Um, so there's a lot more questions. And we, you know, it'd be great to have more Indigenous people involved. Um, my master's and PhD has been completely paid for just because I'm Pawnee. Fundamentally, it's, they need, they want, the field wants more Indigenous people and support them. So if you have relatives that are interested in history, in writing, like I use all the sciences when I'm an archaeologist, geology, chemistry, physics. I love history and it's applied history. And I get to spend the summers out in, out in the field. Um, yes, the Pawnee language is still spoken. Um, we actually have, um, because of COVID, we have language classes. Um, we have YouTube videos. You can, you can search them online thanks to the Pawnee Nation Cultural Resources Division. Um, and yeah, as, as Matt said, funding is a huge issue for us. Um, but we're trying, we have, I think like two native speakers left. Um, but we have, we have two Pawnees who got their master's in linguistic anthropology from Oklahoma, um, who have, they're about a little older than I am. And they have done some amazing work and including Adrian Spider Horse Chief, you know, Matt and the Cultural Resources Division Director Herb Adson. So we're, we're holding on to it. We have a dictionary out of Indiana. Um, 
which is also an online resource, um, American Indian Studies Institute, Research Institute, you can type in Pawnee Dictionary and it's this little search thing. Um, we have a dictionary that was co-wrote by uh, Doug Parks and um, Nora Pratt. And then, yeah, you can search YouTube Pawnee language classes um, and it goes through days of the weeks, salutations, months, and they're, it's still coming out as they're doing this, it's still coming out. So I think there's like four lessons up, Matt, if that's right, um, four or five. And they have both the South Bend dialect and the Skeety dialect. I, I want to say, I think there's nine lessons. Uh, I was going to type this in, but I might as well say it while I'm on here. Ugh, my voice is hoarse. <clears throat> uh, if you get onto Facebook, you can find our cultural resources division. Um, also, I was trying to think, the, the Pawnee Nation Museum. Mm -hmm. And then we have a um, language Facebook site and those lessons will be posted there and then you know, kind of shared across the many different Facebook groups that belong to the tribe. Uh, so you should be able to find something like that. Mm -hmm. um, Alec asked if there's anything you can do to get involved. If you're looking for graduate school, send me an email. Um, I'll put my email down there for everybody in the chat box. Um, this is my, the one that I really answer. And let's talk. Um, you know, we'll have more um, after, after this, I'll send out a survey tomorrow for everybody. If you guys like the talk, what could be better? What other topics you guys like to be uh, like to get covered? Um, there's some fascinating work doing with horse horse spread in the plains right now. Um, some interesting developments that we're not quite sure what to do with. Plains warfare is a fascinating topic, um, and so we'd like to kind of expand this. Um, so just just let us know, and if any if you have further questions. I'm available. You can email me. Um, if you like listening to my, me talk, I have a podcast. It's called A Life in Ruins. Um, it does it does better than it should be, and it's actually quite terrifying um, how popular that thing has gotten. Um, it's a little different format from this, not as professional. And we're on social media um, as well. So um, thank you guys. Oh, Nolan. Yeah, so Nolan, we're not sure right now, tentatively, field school, the excavation at Lynch is still on. Hopefully we can get COVID under control. That's the big deal. Um, I will let, when, when it does happen, if you guys follow the Pawnee Nation Facebook page, if you follow the museum and the Pawnee Nation Facebook page, when we know what's going on, we'll post flyers and let people know, hey, uh, people can come out to, to Lynch. We're trying to keep people within a week. So that way we don't have five weeks of people coming in and out. Um, that way we can dedicate time because we'd really like, you know, Rob and others to show up so we can send them special attention, the Pawnee delegation, and then, you know, other, other people. So um, you don't really have to sign up. Just we'll send out flyers and you'll have contact information. That's not until um, late May to early July. So we're half a year out, eight months out. So just keep it on your calendar. You guys have my email, follow up. I want to thank everyone for joining, for joining today. Um, I really appreciate uh, you guys being here. So with that, I think we will end it just an hour 20. Um, thank you everyone for being here. I thank you, Kenneth. All right. Let's see, we still have a couple other people. Might have just bounced out. Have any questions, Jackson? Not really, just except for the fact of like how is the how is COVID going to affect like how Lynch hat like worked last year and like location wise? Uh if 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 COVID is still a problem, we're just not gonna excavate. It'll be another field workless summer. Okay. That's how it's gonna affect it because we can't risk bringing 30 students out in one yeah. place it's just not a good look yeah yeah so that's that's about it i'll let you guys know okay um all right i'm gonna go